Hey you guys, Matt Brunig here. Sorry for the delay in getting this video out. I had some technical difficulties, uh, but uh, they are now resolved. Uh, for this video, I wanted to talk about Social Security. That's in the news lately. Someone sent me a request to talk about how Social Security is not a program where you sort of pay in money and then get your money back. You know, it's not like a personal savings program. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and do that, um, you know, and I, I think I have some slightly novel insights on this that uh, go beyond what you might have uh, seen before, if you're familiar with this topic. Um, so let's just jump right in. Uh, so for starters, uh, the Social Security benefit is in what in the welfare state world we would call an earnings related benefit or sometimes an income related benefit or sometimes an income linked benefit uh, depending on what uh, resource you're using uh, taxonomically that's what it will be called and it's important because earnings related is the key it's not contribution related it's not based on how much tax you paid or how much um, social security contribution you made into the program it is related to your earnings, right? So uh, to kind of get jump started on this, uh, it's important to note that the uh, Social Security Administration, the way that it uh, administers benefits and figures out how much benefit you are owed uh, is that it collects your earnings, it collects a record of how much money you earn every year for your entire life. And it stores that information in something called the master earnings file, right? So it's just a big database and everyone's social security number, you know, has beside it every year that it worked and how, or every year that you worked and how much you earned in each year. Um, and when it goes to run the formula that determines how much you receive, it looks that the input, the data that goes, is fed into that formula is the earnings data. Now, it also knows how much you contributed into the Social Security program. In fact, if you uh, open up a, uh, one of these accounts, a My Social Security account, you can go to this website here and you can like create an account and blah, blah, blah. You can actually see, it's actually neat, I've done this before. You can see exactly how much you've earned in every year of your life because they've got it in their database. And they'll actually show you also how much you've ever paid in Social Security tax um, I don't know if they show you how much just you paid, quote unquote, or you plus the employer, but you can just take the amount that you paid, if it's just that, and double it um, to get both sides of the Social Security tax. Anyways, in this file, in their databases, they know exactly how much you've earned, and they know exactly how much you've contributed. But the amount that is uh, that you've contributed is not included at any point in any kind of calculation about how much benefit you receive. It's completely irrelevant, right? So, you know, that's an important, uh, I guess, starting point to understand, uh, you know, just mechanically, they don't care about how much you've ever contributed. That's got nothing to do with the benefits you're owed. Secondly, of course, there's also no like personal account element to Social Security, even though you can go on to this website here and you have like a personal account of sorts. There's no uh, like uh, separation of funds where the amount you contributed is linked to your account and then you can like draw upon it or something like that. That doesn't happen at all. They have a record of it. But there's no account in the same way that you might have a checking account or an investment account or whatever. There's also no just like general account. Um, there is a Social Security Trust Fund, but the Social Security Trust Fund just consists of these special issue treasury bonds. So like back in the day when Social Security was running a surplus, meaning that there were more uh, Social Security tax contributions than there were benefits being paid out, what they would do with that surplus, quote unquote, is they would go buy special issue bonds from the treasury. What that all amounts to is uh, like a kind of uh, an internal government thing where money comes out of the Social Security account and goes into the Treasury account. 
though these are kind of the same thing on some level. And then into the Social Security account, there are these bonds that are like treasury bonds, except they're not really like treasury bonds because they are these special issue treasury bonds. And the Social Security Administration is not allowed to like go out and sell those bonds in the same way that if I went and bought treasury bonds, I could go sell them on the secondary market. So, you know, some people will say this is just IOUs. And I mean, I guess on some level it is. I would say more than anything, it's just kind of it's just kind of nothing, right? There's there's nothing in the trust fund except, uh, you know, this sort of fictional uh, security, this fictional bond that uh, commits legally, I guess, the treasury to pay it back. But that could be changed at any time by law. Another way to, to think about this is uh, occasionally... Uh, there will be these um, accountings of like federal of like of, of government budgets, government balance sheets across the world, right? So you say how much you know how much net worth does the U.S. government have versus how much net worth does the German government have or whatever, and in those accounts. They don't, they don't, this is just nothing, right? It's, uh, so it's, it's, it's an internal government bond. It's debt that the government owes itself. It's sort of meaningless, right? So it exists. It seems to serve some kind of function and make people feel a little bit better uh, about the program. Um, but there's no money in the trust fund, like not really. Um, and there's no money in your personal account. You don't even have a personal account. They do keep track of how much you've contributed, but that amount that you contributed is never factored into anything related to the benefits you receive. They only look at your earnings file. Um, and now sometimes, uh, and, and we can go into it a little bit uh, more deeply here. Um, so this is an explanation of how much uh, benefit you receive. And I think I talked about this in a prior uh, a sh video about Social Security. I think it was called the Republicans want to cut Social Security by 23% or something like that. Anyways, what they do is they take your top 35 years of earnings. Uh, they index, they use a, a something called the average wage index to kind of update those earnings to the modern period, right? So if you made, you know, $20,000 in 1980, that's not going to count as $20,000. It's going to be sort of like what the equivalent of earning $20,000 would be today. And they use something called the average wage index to make that conversion. But basically, they go through all 35 of those years. They convert uh, the wage, the earnings to kind of a modern day equivalent of that using the average wage index, right? And then uh, after they get those uh, values all summed up, they get an average index monthly earnings. So it's just kind of like, what was your monthly earnings over the period? Again, kind of updated to what they would be um, if you earned them today. And then after they figured out what your average index monthly earnings were across you know, your, your life, they then apply this formula, uh, the primary insurance amount formula, um, and, you know, the way that works is, you know, you get a certain fraction. Uh, here's the bend points, actually. They got the bend points here. For the first, you know, certain amount of, of earnings, you know, they were replaced 90% of what you earned. And then for the next set of earnings, they, they replace a smaller percentage. And then for the next chunk of earnings, they, they replace a 15%, I think, is the last little chunk. And then there's like a maximum benefit, right? Anyways, the, the point here is not to uh, precisely explain all the parameters of this formula. It's just to uh, make it clear that this benefit formula takes as its input earnings. Earnings. Then it indexes those earnings, and then it divides by, uh, you know, uh, a certain amount to get monthly earnings, and then it applies a percentage to that, right? But it's earnings is the input, not contribution. Your contribution is irrelevant. Now, when I uh, say this, sometimes people kind of roll their eyes and they go, oh, Matt, you're being really pedantic here. Yeah, they don't look at how much you contributed. They look at your earnings. But the Social Security tax is set up as a percent of your earnings. Specifically, it's 12.4% of your earnings up to a certain cap. And so... You know, to the extent that everyone's paying 12.4% on their earnings, 
then earnings and contributions are going to be basically the same thing, right? The numbers will be different, right? You would have to write a different formula if you were using contributions as the basis for benefits instead of earnings as the basis for benefits, right? You would, you would, the formula numbers would be different. But since these two things track one another, aren't they basically the same thing? And the answer to that is actually no, they are not basically the same thing. And I can show this with a few, um, I can demonstrate this with a few examples. So uh, for starters, to be eligible for any benefits at all from the Social Security program, you need to have 40 quarters of coverage. Um, and a quarter of coverage Basically, uh, you, you get a quarter of coverage by earning $1,640 in a year. And so you can earn four times that amount and get four quarters of coverage in the year. When they first started Social Security, they actually would check like a quarter of the year. So like the first three months you had to earn a certain amount, the next three months you had to earn a certain amount. Now they just do this dollar amount where if you earn 1640 in a year, you get one quarter of coverage. If you earn twice that, you get two quarters of coverage. If you earn three times that, you get three quarters of coverage, all the way to four quarters of coverage. And that's the maximum amount you can get in a given year. Well, you got to get 40 of those, of those quarters over the course of your lifetime to be eligible for any benefit at all. If you fall short of that, you don't get any Social Security, despite the fact that you will have contributed into the program, right? Because if you uh, got, say, 39 quarters of coverage and you paid in dutifully through all 39 of those quarters, um, you will have contributed conceivably 100,000 more dollars to the Social Security program, but you will be ineligible for benefits, right? And so I uh, illustrated this uh, here. Let me bump up the size a little bit. Um, okay, so this is like the most extreme example, but it you know it illustrates a general point, and and you could have examples in between this most extreme that are less extreme than this, but still you know uh, 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 still true. Okay, so let's take we got two people here. We got the red uh, person and the green person. Okay, the red person is ineligible for benefits. So the red person has. Uh, this is their earnings record, right? So in, in year one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, they earned $160,200. That is the uh, maximum taxable earnings for Social Security, right? So they earned right at the maximum cap, okay? So, you know, each of these four years, they got, each of these nine years, they got four quarters of coverage, right? So four times nine is 36, and then in year 10, they were $1 shy of getting four years of coverage, of four quarters of coverage, excuse me. So they only got three quarters of coverage, right? So they got 36 quarters of coverage in the first nine years, and then they got three quarters of coverage in year 10. So total cover quarters of coverage is only 39, right? And you got to get 40 to be eligible for benefits at all, right? So they fall short. They're one quarter short of being eligible. And we're assuming here they only work 10 years in their life. Every other year, they posted a zero uh, on their earnings record. You know, maybe they were disabled. Who knows? Okay. So let's look what this totals out to. This totals out to them earning over these 10 years nearly $1.5 million and paying nearly $180,000 into the Social Security program. This is just this figure multiplied by 12.4. You see? So they paid $180,000 into the Social Security program. The amount of benefit they're eligible for, zero. They try to retire, they get zero dollars. Now we got this person over here. They also only worked for 10 years in their life. And they worked exactly the amount necessary to get four quarters of coverage in all 10 years, right? So if you do $6,560, you get four quarters of coverage. And they did that all four years. So they got to their 40 quarters of coverage. They are eligible for benefits when they retire. This is the total amount of tax they paid, which again is just this number multiplied by 12.4%. Uh, and so across these 10 years, they earned $65,600 and paid $8,134 into the Social Security program. All right, so we can actually do the math here. The... Uh, <laughs> 
the the person who's ineligible for benefit contributed 22 times as much into the Social Security program as the person who is eligible for benefits. Right? 22 times. So you could, could this is the maximum spread I think you can accomplish doing this kind of uh, uh, hypothetical. Maximum spread. You could have one person who contributes 22 times more money into the Social Security program than another person, and that person is ineligible, while the person who contributed way less is eligible. Why? Because it's not based on contribution. It's based on your earnings history, and you have to hit a specific kind of earnings history. In this case, you have to hit 40 quarters of coverage, which means you have to have work, your earnings have to be spread out in a certain pattern across a certain number of years in order to be eligible for anything at all. Right? It's an earnings related benefit, it's not a contribution related benefit. Um, what else can we do? What else did I wanted to do? I have one more example here. Okay, so the other thing is, and I mentioned this already, it's not only that you need 40 quarters, but notice they only use 35 years of your earnings in the benefit formula, right? So they take the average of your top 35 years. If you have less than 35 years, but you have your 40 quarters of coverage, the, you know, if you only have, say, like 30, 30 years, then for those other five years, they'll put zeros in, and that's necessary to make the formula work, right? If, but if you have over 35 years, the amount, all those extra years beyond 35 are irrelevant. They don't count at all. They don't, they don't do anything for you. And again, yet you would still contribute Social Security tax on them, right? So here's how we can illustrate this scenario. So let's imagine two workers, one worked for, they make the exact amount of money, same amount of money every year that they worked, right? $50,000, you know, solid middle income, okay? So we got this person who worked 50 years and this person who worked 35 years, okay? So we can go down here. We see they're just making the same amount of money every year. Here are the years. And they're paying the same amount of tax every year. And then when we get to year 36, the person who worked 50 years just keeps on working, right? And the person who worked uh, 35 years, he's done, right? Maybe he got uh, started later on in life. Maybe he took uh, his benefit earlier, whatever. It doesn't matter, okay? So what's the difference then between them? The, when it comes to contribution, right, this is the tax paid. The person who worked 50 years contributed $310,000 of taxes into the Social Security program. The person who worked um, only 35 years contributed $217,000 into the Social Security program, right? So the, the red guy over here, the 50-year worker, he contributed 43% more than the green guy, who's a 35-year worker, right? Yet... These two people with these two earnings records and these two contribution records would be eligible for the exact same a benefit, the exact same benefit, right? I mean, you would, you know, there might be a little bit because you're adjusting for average wage or whatever, but I'm kind of like pushing that to the, to the, to the side for the moment because that's not the point. <laughs> um, these two people would get this exact same benefit, Right? So you can contribute 43% more than someone else, and it could be even greater than that. I don't, this is just a little scenario put together. I didn't try to max out what, how could you get the biggest spread here? You could contribute, in this case, 43% more to the Social Security program over your lifetime and be eligible for the exact same benefit, the exact same monthly benefit, monthly check for the rest of your life. And of course, in this case, you could contribute 22 times more and be eligible for nothing <laughs> than someone uh, while someone else well, is eligible for benefits. Um, and this is just, again, to drive home the point that Social Security is based on earnings. It's not based on contribution. And I think one of the reasons people struggle with this, I would say there's two reasons, right? One is because people just don't like the idea that they are, uh, you know, receiving welfare benefits. Right, but Social Security fundamentally works by uh, basically taking, you know, reducing the paychecks of people who are working right now by 12.4%. We reduce their paychecks by 12.4%, and 
and then we take the money, if you will, and we give it out to people who are old and disabled and survivors, if you're talking about Social Security, right? So everyone who's like a worker takes a 12.4% haircut so that elderly people and disabled people uh, uh, can just get cash and then they can spend it. That's really the way the program works, right? There's no personal savings component to it. You're not getting back what you contributed. When you are old and you're on the Social Security program, you're not living off of what you contributed to the program. You are living off the people who are now working, who are coming up behind you. That's what you're living. And when you were paying taxes in the program, you weren't contributing to your Social Security. You were, cont- you were just giving off money to the elderly who were, you know, the, who were old when you were working. Right, so it's a generational transfer that occurs, you know, perpetually. Workers send money to the old. <laughs> workers send money to the old. When you are old, you are depending on workers to to effectively send money to you through this system. And when you are workers, you are sending money to the old. It's a it's a cross generational uh, sort of like solidaristic program. It's not a personal account. And I think a lot of people just really don't like that, um, you know, because. Welfare is such a stigmatized thing and everyone likes to think that I'm just living, you know, my own life and I'm not depending on other people. And, and in fact, we've kind of almost hived off uh, Social Security from the rest of the welfare state, right? So that if you're receiving your Social Security check, uh, there, you don't feel shame. But if you're receiving food stamps, you do feel shame. But it's, it's all the same thing at the end of the day. You're receiving a, a income that is not uh, connected to your, you know, current work status not connect you know it's not factor income labor income or capital income for that matter it's transfer income it's 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 all the same thing but people don't like to think that and so when you have a program especially that's very popular in the u.s there's a tendency to uh want to kind of put a rhetorical moat around it that says that's not like the other kind of welfare in fact and there was a great uh piece about this many years ago in the washington post i think it won uh you know a pulitzer or something like that i probably should have pulled it up but i didn't think about it before i started the video it was about uh people whose job it is to try to get old people to sign up for food stamps because uh elderly people who are on social security are sometimes still poor enough to be eligible for food stamps but very few of them sign up for food stamps um and you know there's lots of reasons for that, but one reason for that is that, you know, they feel ashamed to sign up for food stamps. It's kind of funny, you know, absurd on some level to think, you know, that someone who is living off of checks from the government is like, ah, but not the food stamp part, right? Not like a little debit card that I go to buy food from, but the cash that they put in my account, that's okay. Um, but they do feel that way, and it's because of the way that we have... Um, you know, we've decided to talk about these uh, programs, the different ways we've tried to talk about them. Anyways, the people whose job it is to try to sign them up, their big selling point is always, you paid into this, actually. You paid, did you not? You paid taxes your whole life, right? You paid for food stamps. So they try to kind of convert food stamps rhetorically into the thing that we all pretend Social Security is. Because, of course, these people are clearly okay receiving Social Security because they have kind of bought into that myth. So maybe we can just kind of spread that myth over into food stamps and get them interested in signing up uh, for that as well. And apparently it's reasonably successful um, if you can get them thinking like, oh, no, 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 you're, this is not welfare. You, you paid for food stamps. You, you paid for this your whole life. Um, so anyways, that's, that's, I think, reason one why people get confused about this. Reason two is because, well, maybe I should go to three reasons. Reason two is that old age benefits, um, they, they occur after your working life. And so it's just very natural and easy to just kind of be like, well, hey, I worked my whole life. So didn't I kind of like contribute my whole life? And so you see, like... Because of the timing of them, it occurs after your work life. And so it just very beautifully uh, fits in there. But earnings-related benefits are not constrained only to old age benefits, right? So uh, we have at least, uh, what, two or three other kinds of benefits like this, um, not always in the U.S., but in, in the welfare state world, right? So unemployment benefits work like this. 
Um, I, I became unemployed about 18 months into my first like real job, you know, prior to that point I would work like summer jobs and stuff like that. But in terms of like my real like career job, I became unemployed 18 months into my first, uh, job and I was eligible for unemployment benefits. I, I had worked enough to be eligible for unemployment benefits and the amount that they gave me was based on my earnings, how much I was earning before I became unemployed, just like social security just like Social Security. It's the same basic program. It's just that I'm not getting it because I, I became old and retired. I'm getting it because I lost my job. But it's an earnings-related benefit. You have to have worked a certain amount to be eligible for it. And then the amount you're eligible for is connected to how much you previously earned. But obviously, I had not paid anywhere near the amount that I received from the program when I was unemployed, because I'd only paid, you know, a, I don't know, a few thousand dollars, a thousand dollars, maybe max, I don't know, into the into the unemployment insurance program. At that point, I'd only been working for 18, 18 months. I'd paid almost nothing into this program, but I was eligible for a big benefit because I was it was connected to my my prior earnings. Um, old age benefits work exactly exactly the same way. Um, disability benefits work that way as well. Um, and paid leave, parental leave benefits, uh, uh, sickness leave benefits to some extent, depending on the country. Uh, these leave benefits also are earnings-related benefits, meaning that the amount you receive is typically connected to what you used to earn, right? What you were, what you were earning right up until you needed to essentially dislocate from work, right? So you could dislocate from work because you're old and retiring, because you're disabled, because you're unemployed, because you need time off to do like medical leave or parental leave or whatever. But in all those cases, you get earnings-related benefits. And the reason why I think people are able to kind of hive the old age benefits off is just because the timing of it, it happens after you're entirely done with your work. But that's just kind of a happenstance of what it is for a benefit to be an old age benefit. Right, taxonomically, it's no different than any of these other earnings-related benefits, which we don't usually talk about in this way. With that said, um, you know, I do think it's a mistake to have an earnings-related benefit that is, that that requires that that pays that doesn't have a minimum benefit for people who don't who don't have very high earnings. Right. So, and you know, in this case right here. This person who, who only got 39 quarters of coverage, they get $0 from the Social Security program. Now, they might be eligible for Supplemental Security Income, SSI, but the proper way to structure this benefit, just like you should structure unemployment benefits, a paid leave benefits, and disability benefits, is to pay people an amount that is based on their prior earnings. And the reason we do that is because we want there to be income smoothing, right? We don't want your income to fall dramatically when you become unemployed or when you need to take time off or when you become disabled. We want your income to, you know, maybe it'll go down a little bit, but it'll be smoothed, right? And so that's why we base it on what you were earning before. But on top of making sure people have a smooth trip into, you know, their exits from the labor market for whatever reason, we also want to make sure that anyone in this status has a nice solid floor that they can't fall below. And so the way you would do that is you would you would create an earnings related benefit that also has a minimum floor that no one can go below. And so in this case, this person ought to be eligible for a minimum floor benefit um, set equal to whatever, right? It could be the poverty line or one and a half times the poverty line, whatever, right? But you, you should have a floor. And the same thing should be true for unemployment benefits as well, right? Is that you should have a floor where um, maybe you didn't, you weren't working previously, or maybe you didn't rack up enough um, earnings over the prior 18 months before you got uh, unemployed, you should have a floor that everyone who's unemployed should get this, at least the floor benefit, maybe more, right, depending on their prior earnings. The same thing for parental leave, the same thing for disability benefits, right? In the U.S., we kind of have this floor in the form of supplemental security income, like I said before, SSI. But SSI is income tested and asset tested. You really want to get rid of those income and asset tests and just have a nice clean floor where it just said, where the only rule is if you got to be old enough to get it, right? If you're elderly, you're at least eligible for the floor, 
right? Maybe more if you had a earnings, high earnings, but you're at least eligible for the floor. If you're disabled, right, and the disability determination services check the box that say you're disabled, you should be at least eligible for the floor. The same thing for unemployed. If you're job seeking, not employed, you should be at least eligible for the floor. And that should not be income tested, asset tested, or whatever. It should be based on your categorical status as an old person, a disabled person, an unemployed person, someone who just had kids, whatever, right? Um, that is not how the benefit is structured right now, um, but that's also a little bit of a, a digression from the point here. So yeah, anyway, I think I've kind of exhausted every measure I can, uh, I, I can to, to drive this point home. Uh, benefits are based on an earnings-related formula, not based on your contributions. Your contributions, uh, they do record them. You can go like C, but they don't ever factor in. There's no personal account where your money is like sitting around. Even the Social Security Administration technically has a trust fund account, but it's basically fake. Um, you know, Social Security is just a program where current workers send money off to the currently retired and the amount that the currently retired get is in part related uh, on how much related to how much they earn during their life for income smoothing purposes. But that's it. It's just a welfare program. There's nothing nothing else to it. So uh, like I said, you know, like, subscribe, all that. Like I said, sorry it took a while. I did legit have technical difficulties that I've now resolved. Um, but I, I should have some more more videos coming soon. And, and keep sending your ideas. This was an idea that uh, a, a viewer sent me. So um, I like to respond to those.